Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 312th episode, we have a bunch of news. No longer SVP. We're back to the regular dinosaur news. Regularly scheduled programming, one might say. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a lot of catching up to do on new dinosaurs. So I'm going to do two new dinosaurs this week. We also have some other dinosaur news. And we have Dinosaur of the Day Sonorosaurus and a review of Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous, which we watched over the period of a few weeks with some of our patrons. And speaking of patrons, we want to thank some of you who help us keep the podcast running. This week, we'd like to thank Dino Mo, Ray, Kessler, Argentrinosaurus, Stego Steve, Bilal, Richard, Christine, the Georges family, and Lucas and Eli. Yeah, thank you so much for all of your support. It's really cool to read about everybody's projects on our Discord. So if you want to hear about what's going on or talk about dinosaur projects of your own, then join our community, patreon.com slash I know dino. And real quick, I want to just mention last week we mentioned Jeopardy. And of course, we recorded the show before we knew that Alex Trebek died, which is very sad. Yeah. I saw a quote from Ken Jennings where he said, Trebek is a hero to America's nerds, which I thought was pretty fitting. Yep. Good quote. Yeah. We were definitely really sad to hear the news, although it was pretty expected. I'm curious who the new host is going to be. It seems like the two strongest contenders are Ken Jennings and LeVar Burton, which are both interesting choices. Oh, I hadn't heard about LeVar Burton. He's been tweeting about it for months that like when Trebek retires, he would be interested in potentially being the replacement. He's getting the word out there. Yeah. <laughs> we thought it was going to be Ken Jennings because he got brought onto the show as like a... Producer. Yeah. Not too long ago. Like maybe they just have him on deck. But I don't know. It'll be interesting. I did do a search for dinosaur topics on Jeopardy, and I only found one time where they had a dinosaur category. Really? I would have thought it more often, because I know we've definitely seen that episode. Yeah. So it was pretty recent. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, this was one where the category was literally dinosaur. I think we've seen other episodes where they just have like a dinosaur clue. Like it might be like kings, and then it would be like this tyrant king, hmm. blah, blah, blah. And you have to know it's T-Rex. But Yeah. Definitely a lot of science gets into Jeopardy, so. Ken Jennings has written some dinosaur books, so maybe they'll get more dinosaur categories. True. Good point. And now on to our news. You're not the one who starts the news. <laughs> Sometimes I am. <laughs> well, I'm starting at this time. I have a new dinosaur that I need to discuss. It was published in Cretaceous Research by Nicholas Longridge and others. It's actually the first ever hadrosaurid material found in Africa. Ooh. First ever. And hadrosaurs. I mean, there are so many hadrosaurs. It's amazing that there has never been hadrosaur material found in Africa before. And there's a good reason for that. Hadrosaurids were really only the quote unquote cows of the Cretaceous in North America and Laurasia. But in Gondwana, especially South America, Africa and India, the cows of the Cretaceous were really the titanosaurs. What? Because we there weren't a lot of hadrosaurids around there. And it was titanosaurs that were taking up all the space eating all the plants okay maybe they're eating a lot of plants but they weren't getting eaten in bulk is that what you think cows of the cretaceous means that they were like <laughs> judging by your tone that's wrong <laughs> <laughs> well, well i thought people when they said cows of the cretaceous meant that they were just like ubiquitous plant eaters i thought it meant that they were a source of food it could be i mean titanosaurs were right they were there were lots of dinosaurs that we think were specialized just to eat titanosaurs hmm. like carcharodontosaurs and things i know this is not your favorite thing to think about but mm, tell us about the hadrosaur <laughs> okay so its full name is ajnabia odysseus and ajnabia is from ajnabi which is arabic for foreigner and odysseus is quote after the mythical voyager end quote so obviously they're assuming that ajnabia wouldn't be expected to be found in Africa. And like we were saying, there weren't any other hadrosaurids ever known from Africa. So how did it get there? Exactly. It went on some crazy odyssey like Odysseus mm. is the well, at least that's what the name would have you believe. Well, if it was the full odyssey, it would have made it back home. <laughs> True. So it's like a failed Odysseus. <laughs> Unless we find out later, actually, there were a lot of hadrosaurids in Africa. And there, this one started in Africa, went to Europe, and then came back to Africa? Yes. 
<laughs> okay. So, since hadrosaurids weren't around until the Cretaceous, and by that point, Gondwana and Laurasia weren't connected anymore, this would mean that hadrosaurids had to swim to Africa or otherwise transport themselves across water in one way or another. Maybe on an epic <laughs> boat of some sort. <laughs> You're really going with the Odysseus <laughs> yeah. analogy. It's fun to think about. It's not necessarily. There are uh, some other options that I, I'll get into later. But the other possibility is that it wasn't actually Ajnabia and it could have been an ancestor that came over because the f idea that the first one we ever find is the individual or even the species that was the first one to come over from Europe is pretty unlikely. The odds are not in favor. No. Ajnabia is a lambiosaurine, which is the group that includes Parasaurolophus with the big head crest. And we think it's a lambiosaurine rather than some other hadrosaurid, mostly based on the height of the maxilla, which is the top of the jaw, if you want to call it that, and some other little details. Unfortunately, we don't have any idea about ornamentation because we only found basically the jaws. So who knows what kind of ornamentation it might have had on its skull. Could have been something really cool or it could have been really boring. We don't know. We only found a few pieces of the jaws. The best piece is that maxilla, but it is full of teeth, so it's pretty neat looking. Although without the teeth, I think the fossil would look like just any other piece of sandstone because it's very sand colored. It's actually really interesting looking. It doesn't look like a lot of other dinosaur fossils that I've seen, but it's pretty cool. Is it flat? It, I mean, it's a maxilla, so it's kind of flat, but it's got all the teeth sticking out of it and a little bit of the palate going with it, too. So you can see some three-dimensional structure to it. But I think without the teeth sticking out of it, it would not be obvious as a fossil at all because it doesn't have a whole lot of shape to it. Hmm. Or And there aren't like, it's not enough of the skull where you can see like where the orbit would be or anything. The maxilla is only about 156 millimeters or 6.1 inches long. And they estimate that it would have been around... 200 millimeters or 7.9 inches if it wasn't broken because the end of it is broken off. So that's really tiny <laughs> for a hadrosaurid, an eight inch for the jaws. You think about something like an Edmontosaurus with that big old mouth sticking out in hmm. front of on its head, you know, the duck bill, as they used to be called. Eight inches of duck bill is not that much. Like that's practically the size of some big ducks today. Maybe not quite. That'd be a very large duck. Mm. But <laughs> it's definitely not like Edmontosaurus size. Adding to that is they looked at the structure of the bone a little bit and they said it doesn't have that sort of spongy structure that you'd expect to see if it was growing rapidly. And that might indicate that it was nearing its full grown size, which is crazy because they have a silhouette of its size and it's basically around the size of Deinonychus. Mm. It's like a little tiny and it's a hadrosaurid, like a derived hadrosaur. It's ridiculous. It's only, I would describe it as like hip to chest height and then maybe about 10 feet long because, you know, they've got these long tails and everything. So they're a lot longer. If you just give the length estimate, it makes it sound a lot bigger than it really is. But yeah, like Deinonychus type size is basically where this was at. Helps to be small to make these epic journeys. Maybe. I mean, it does if you're like on a raft or something. But if you're trying to swim across the water, that, that could be pretty perilous. <laughs> it reminds me of the show we've been watching about tiny animals that in storms, they end up on branches that go into the ocean and then they wash up on another island shore. Yeah. And that specifically is a lot easier to do when you're a small animal. That's called rafting, by the way. Okay. I'm going to get into that in a minute. But yes, that is potentially one way that this dinosaur could have made it to Africa. And if hadrosaurids did make it to Africa by rafting, it would help that there was a really tiny one like this around that as a hatchling or a small juvenile or even as an adult maybe yeah. <laughs> could have made it across. So a raft, otherwise known as a type of boat. Well, not really. This is just a raft of debris, <laughs> like fallen trees and things. We're just trying to bring it back to the Odyssey. Oh, the Odysseus thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Ajnabia was from the late Maastrichtian of Morocco. And I honestly didn't know that there was exposed Maastrichtian rock in Morocco because we're always talking about the chem, -chem beds. It's chem, chem beds this, chem, chem beds that. Uh, Spinosaurus. <laughs> exactly. That's where Spinosaurus is from and Carcharodontosaurus. But the chem, chem beds are about 30 million years old or way back in the middle of the Cretaceous. And this is really at the very end 
of the Maastrichtian. It's the same as the Hell Creek in North America. So really, I think comparisons to Edmontosaurus across the world are a pretty good thing to keep in mind because they were they coexisted in time, if not place. Ajnabia was found a lot closer to the coast and the major cities than the Kemkem beds are. It's about halfway in between Marrakesh and Fez, if you're familiar with Morocco's geography. And those are just fun cities to say because they're both super important culturally. Phylogenetically, Ajnabia is a close relative to European Lambiosaurines. So again, it draws this connection between it probably had to come over from Europe because back in the Cretaceous, there was Aranosaurus, which was a hadrosaur form. So you could potentially come up with an idea for maybe that hadrosaur form, which wasn't a, a true hadrosaur, could have evolved and with convergent evolution maybe would have ended up looking like a hadrosaurid but based on some of the details of the bones it looks a lot more like the contemporary european hadrosaurids so rather than this being convergent evolution in existing groups in africa it looks like it was that odysseus (laughs) type adventure from europe they really emphasize that in the paper saying quote modeling shows that lambiosaurians dispersed from asia to europe then to africa end quote and maybe more interesting to you, Sabrina, is that the authors think titanosaurs might have also used oceanic dispersal, as they call it. Yeah. So they gave a few examples of this. This is the part where they're like different ways to do oceanic dispersal. One version is tortoises, which apparently made it to the Galapagos, probably from South America, over a thousand kilometers away. Wow. And we don't really know exactly how they might have done that. And if you find a tortoise, don't throw it in the water. We've seen videos of that happening. And it's possible that sauropods could have made it to Africa even without swimming all that well, because the authors say, quote, a combination of light vertebrae and heavy limb bones would have caused them to float upright, keeping the head out of the water even when exhausted or asleep, end quote. (laughs) Which is just a hilarious image of like a sleeping sauropod floating along in like the ocean adrift, (laughs) hoping to reach Africa or some other island. (laughs) I like that image. Yeah, it's pretty funny. And then, like you mentioned, Sabrina, there's also the potential for rafting on floating debris. That's how iguanas and rodents have spread to a lot of islands. And there have been rafts seen as big as 60 meters or 200 feet across. So if you have a dinosaur that's just a couple feet tall and less than 10 feet long, oh, goodness. there should be room on that raft. I thought you had said rats seen because you're just saying rats meant on islands. <laughs> no, the uh, rats. What, how have we never mentioned a rat that was 60 meters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, this is rafts okay. with, a, with a F in the middle. Yeah. But regardless, whether the titanosaurs or hadrosaurids swam or drifted or rafted, They got to Africa somehow and dispersed. And that's that life finding a way again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes by accident, sometimes on purpose. Yeah. And this is also yet another reason that we need to build a natural history museum in Morocco. It's like one of the main, most exciting places for paleontology that doesn't have any major natural history museum. It's really Morocco and Mongolia, to me, are the two places that are most dire need of a dinosaur museum. Two places that we really want to visit as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely at the top of the list. Before I do the next new dinosaur, I'm going to take a break for a paper about dinosaur brains. This one was published in the Journal of Anatomy by Rodrigo Mueller and others, and they were looking at a Buriolestes brain case from southern Brazil. The reason that's useful in looking at brains is because you can use a brain case to reconstruct the brain shape because brains do not fossilize. And really the best you can do is the container in which the brain goes. So like if you imagine a human skull, you can get a pretty good idea about what our brain looks like by looking at that brain hole in our skull. (laughs) The technical term, brain hole. (laughs) Yeah, well, they, they call it an endocast, but yeah, I like brain hole. So using this brain hole, They reconstructed the brain shape, and it is really well correlated with brain function because, say, for example, you have large bulbs, olfactory bulbs to be specific, that will mean that you have a better sense of smell. If there's a big portion of the brain right where your eyes attach to your brain, that means there's probably a better sense of sight, and you can 
do all sorts of other analogies with other parts of the brain, but they can be a little bit less clear as you get farther from the senses. Quick reminder, Buriolestes is a sauropodomorph. It's about 230 million years old, which makes it one of the oldest ancestors to the big sauropods like Apatosaurus. But back in the Triassic, when Buriolestes was around, it was very, very small. This paper gave three weight estimates. They did one by femur circumference, which is kind of the old school way to do it. You figure the leg has to hold up the animal so you can estimate how much weight it was holding up by the strength of the femur. And that gave them 6.65 kilograms or 14.7 pounds. Tiny. Yeah, it's very small. But the other models were even smaller. So convex hulls, which is basically a simulation of how big the animal would have been based on like how much flesh you'd think there would be around the bones, gave 4.35 kilograms or 9.6 pounds. And then they did a more complete 3D sculpture of it. And that gave them four and a half kilograms or 9.9 pounds. So probably around 10 pounds. And that makes it roughly the size of a house cat. Or a very small dog. Yeah. It, I mean, it's not, neither of those are great analogies because it's bipedal and it's weird. So maybe it's more like a big chicken or a small turkey or sure. something. would have acted very different from a cat <laughs> or a dog. Yeah. But it probably would have been a carnivore. So maybe it would have acted a little bit like a cat. But I don't know. Cats are weird. The author's tout that this is the first calculation of the reptile encephalization quotient or req for a triassic dinosaur nice yes but req isn't super useful it's basically a fancy ratio of the size of the brain to the size of the animal and based on that you assume that if something has a big brain and a relatively small body it would be smarter than something that's really big with a tiny brain right but that doesn't explain specializations and yeah, it, Other it, things. it doesn't explain a lot, and it's especially difficult. I mean, it helps that they're using reptile encephalization quotient because reptiles have different sorts of brains than mammals have, so you can't just compare, like, our brain to a T-Rex brain at the same size. But they did their best. What they ended up with was the brain endocast is about 2.8 milliliters in volume, which one place pointed out was a little bit larger than the size of a pea. Hmm. I think that's an analogy to it being a pea brain. Wait, um, <laughs> just to interrupt for a minute, we're talking about, okay, the reptile encephalization quotient, it's maybe a good baseline, but that doesn't mean that just because it's got a small percentage, it's not smart. Yes, but I haven't told you what the REQ of this dinosaur is yet. Oh, okay, I'll wait. <laughs> so even though the brain endocast was 2.8 milliliters in volume, the brain might have been smaller because just like in our skull, the brain doesn't fill every last cubic inch of space in there. There's some empty space. It's good to have a little extra space. For an example, using 50% of the brain endocast size, they have a whole table of different percentages, and I just picked that because it was in the middle. Buriolestes had an REQ of 0 0.9, which compares to Troodon having an REQ of 3.5, which is almost four times as high, or T-Rex with an REQ of 2.5. What's the scale? So in primates, it's pretty high. Again, this isn't the reptile encephalization quotient. This is the more mammalian scaled one. But humans have an EQ of about 7.5. And that's described as the human brain being about seven to eight times larger than an average mammal of the same body size. Mm. So it's trying to estimate, like, based on what you'd expect for an animal of that size, how big is your brain? So I guess a value of one means that you've, you've got the brain size you'd expect for that type of animal at that size. Mm -hmm. So at 0 0.9, this is basically like it's got an average size brain for a reptile of its size. Right. Whereas Troodon, generally considered really intelligent, and it's got, you know, almost three to four times the brain size potentially. On the other hand, Diplodocus has an REQ of 0 0.4, and that's about what you see with most big sauropods. Mm -hmm. Now, going back to my point of how this is a good baseline, but doesn't necessarily mean that they're smart or dumb. Yes. So... That doesn't necessarily mean sauropods or sauropodomorphs were dumb. It's also really weird because when you're talking about a reptile encephalization quotient and it's supposed to be the brain size you'd expect for a reptile of that size, the only reptiles that have ever been the size of sauropods are sauropods. Mm -hmm. So by that definition, it seems like it should be around one. 
because how could you say like, well, if an, a reptile that's 40 tons should have a brain this big when all of the reptiles that are 40 tons have a smaller brain? <laughs> it's sort of a weird, so like the analogy really doesn't work well for the outliers on size because what are you comparing it to? You can only compare it to itself and clearly their brain is the size that it is. So yeah, you end up in this weird circular logic situation. So for really large animals, anyway, people don't usually put any faith in the encephalization quotient. But in general, Burial Estes does have a higher encephalization quotient than Jurassic sauropods. And they say that maybe that's because herbivores needed less brain power than carnivores, because obviously if you're hunting, that might take a little bit more effort. But the weird thing is its encephalization quotient is lower than Jurassic theropods, and they don't really make any effort to explain that. And even weirder is a Murosaurus they put in there, which is a hadrosaur, has an REQ of three, which really <laughs> kind of blows the whole thing out of the water. Like what if we're talking about diets and things like that, unless a Murosaurus was super socialized or something and needed a big brain to deal with sort of communication or something. I don't know. It's this is why we rarely talk about encephalization quotients. We talked about them a little bit in the early days of the podcast before I knew better, but yeah, it's. I don't think it's all that useful. And I think it might be why this paper is the first one to calculate for a Triassic dinosaur because most people just aren't interested in it. It's more useful to look at the individual elements of the brain and say like, oh, it looks like this animal had a, a good olfactory sense. Yeah, exactly. So moving on to that, because we can say some things about it, its eyesight and brain power were good and good enough, they think, to hunt moving prey. Yeah, so it was smart. Yeah, I mean, if that's... What, how you want to define smart. Its teeth are also serrated, and that indicates it probably had a carnivorous diet. So yeah, a brain that would allow you to hunt would be useful. And essentially, all early dinosaurs are considered to have been carnivorous. So this is not surprising that the ancestor to sauropods was carnivorous. Weirdly to me, though, its sense of smell was weaker than later sauropods, which they say means it probably hunted by sight and didn't really rely on its sense of smell that much. But the idea that later sauropods would need a good sense of smell seems strange to me because I never think about herbivores needing a good sense of smell. Maybe it's to scout out the best leaves or maybe they want to smell if there's predators around or something. Those were two of the guesses they gave. Hmm. Were you reading ahead? No. Okay. I'm just that good. So one of them was smelling for predators coming up or if there was a lot of different food around, you know, maybe they would need to smell the type of food that they were able to digest. But another interesting one was they said it might be useful in social behavior. And the way they phrased it was the capability to track chemical secretions. Mm. So it's like in the book Raptor Red, where Red keeps smelling poop. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. And that's kind of their way of communicating with each other. Like, hey, I was here. And Oh, I see. What's going on? So something like that. Like modern animals when they pee to like leave a signature mm -hmm. for other, or at least mammals like dogs do. Yeah, it very well could be. They also point to the fact that Buriolestes has not been found in a group, so maybe it wasn't socialized. And the first known sauropodomorph that was found in a group was Macrocolum, which was about 5 million years later. I didn't realize it was that early. That's still 225 million years ago. That was found in a three individual group. Although, again, just because three individuals were buried together does not mean they had a complex social arrangement. Mm -hmm. But to their credit, Macro Column does have a better sense of smell than Burialestes. So maybe there is something to that. But one way or another, their brains changed a lot and they turned into huge sauropods later. And now we kind of have a better starting point for what those sauropodomorph brains looked like. Yeah, and those sauropods might have been smart. <laughs> I mean, I would say we don't have great evidence for them being really unintelligent, but I don't think they were smart by any stretch. We don't know for sure. I mean, we can be pretty sure. But not 100% sure. Okay. That's the takeaway. It's definitely your takeaway. Mm-hmm. And as promised, I have one more new dinosaur. I still have, I think, 13 more after this one to get through. 
Well, Hopefully really, by the end of the year. They really piled up. They did. It really got away from me. This new dinosaur, though, taking it one at a time, published in Communications Biology by Kang Yu Yu and others. And it's a new dinosaur from Mongolia. Its name is Beg Tsi, and the genus is Beg. The species is Tsi, and Beg Tsi is usually a combination. It's usually just Beg Tsi, and that's a pre-Buddhist god of war. Hmm. So it's like a lot of Asian languages, many proper nouns are just two syllables. So they have their two syllables, then they're Romanized, but they split it. So this genus name is just Beg. So it's kind of like E Chi, where you could just say E, but it, it kind of sounds weird because we're used to long <laughs> dinosaur names. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I'm like, I'll call it Beg because Beg C is kind of hard to say. But you beg to differ. Sure. I mean, I'm okay with it being named Beg. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am kind of surprised that that name was available because genera names have to be unique to an animal, they can't be anywhere else, like with a tick or a beetle, or any kind of animal anywhere Fish. else. Yeah. So this is the first Beg everywhere. Hmm. If you're wondering what kind of god of war Beg Tsi was, they describe it as, quote, commonly portrayed as heavily armored with large rugosities on its body, which refers to the rugose structure on the jugal and serangular, end quote. Hmm. So basically, Beg has some rough patches on it that look like they might have had some armor, And so we're going to name it after this armored looking god of war. But to me, it really seems like Beg C would be a much better name for an ankylosaur. What are we doing naming small ceratopsians after armored gods of war? Well, there's a lot of ceratopsians that have rugose structures on them. Yeah, that's true. I guess for a ceratopsian, it is pretty armored, but it just seems like if you're going to name a dinosaur after... A characteristic of armor should be a dinosaur that's more heavily armored than just a little bit armored for its type. All I hear is bias towards ankylosaurs. That's true. That is what you're hearing. (laughs) Beg was found near Barunbayan in Mongolia, and that's in southern Mongolia, although not that far south. There's still a couple hundred miles before you get to China. And it's from the mid-Cretaceous. They estimated Albion to Cenomanian, which makes it about 100 million years old, plus or minus about 10 million years. Pretty wide age range potentially there. And that makes it before all of the impressive quadrupedal ceratopsids like Triceratops that later evolved. As you might have guessed from my description about it being small and a ceratopsian, it's pretty Cetacosaurus-like, small, bipedal. It's a Neoceratopsian, but a basal Neoceratopsian. There are a lot of these going on in Mongolia. (laughs) Phylogenetically, it's between Cetacosaurus and Aquilops, which we talked about not too long ago. Both of them are depicted as small and bipedal with beaks and with those tail bristles Mm -hmm. on the top of their tail. Beg is only known from a few bones, a rib, a partial left shoulder blade, a hip fragment. But fortunately, they did also find a partial skull and it has most of the left side of the skull intact. So that's where almost all of the information comes from. The skull in total is about 140 millimeters or five and a half inches long, which is actually kind of similar to Ajnabia that we were talking about a minute ago, the little tiny hadrosaurid. If you were thinking of like how small could it be, it's like almost a tachosaurus, its head (laughs) at least. But I think Ajnabia was a little bit longer, whereas... Beg has a little bit bigger proportionally of a head, so its body would still be a little bit smaller. And in general, Beg was about the same size as Cetacosaurus, making it two meters or six feet long or less. And in terms of height next to a human, probably in the knee to hip sort of range. Well, that's weird to think about. That's still like pretty long compared to a human, but short. Yeah, I think like this is sort of like a medium to large dog size. Hmm. It's definitely shorter relatively than a lot of dinosaurs are because these basal ceratopsians and ceratopsians in general don't have much of a tail. So they're a little bit shorter from tip of nose to tail with regards to the same height from foot to shoulder. Beg has a premaxilla with four enlarged cylindrical teeth, as they describe them, which is the most for any basal ceratopsian. 
Premaxilla teeth are really common in these early ceratopsians. I did not realize that. I always think of beaks being toothless, but that's just my weird bird bias, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but Cetacosaurus actually doesn't have premaxillary teeth, and it's by far the most famous member of that group. So that might also be why I forget that they have teeth in their premaxilla. The others, though, have three or fewer teeth, and so this one has four. That might be enough alone to name a new species. That rugose structure or rough texture on the skull that we mentioned a minute ago with the potential armor over it is similar in a lot of ways to Triceratops. And on Triceratops, we've inferred that it's covered in keratin. So it's possible that Bega also had keratin coverings on the sides of its head. Although they said there isn't any sign of a nasal horn. And they also said there isn't a, quote, pronounced jugal boss end quote, which is like what you see on Cetacosaurus, those big pointy things sticking out of the cheeks that make them look a little bit extra alien. There's a little bit of one on Triceratops too, if you look closely. Hmm. There's a little bit of a bump there. They had one angle of the skull from above, but it looks just like a a little tiny bump sticking out of the side. (laughs) It really, to me, seems like it could be a juvenile with all these you know, less defined characteristics and stuff. But then with the potential for that armor already having grown and having more teeth, I don't know. It's hard to say. Just because it's small doesn't mean it's a juvenile. Yeah. And I mean, it's in the same ballpark of size as Cetacosaurus too. So, I mean, some of those Cetacosaurus are juveniles, but in general, a lot of dinosaurs are juveniles. So maybe that isn't the best thing to compare because we might just be comparing juveniles to juveniles anyway feel like I should also point out at SVP this year, we heard about several more species coming up in Mongolia in this early Ceratopsian group, because apparently Mongolia was just chock full of these little Ceratopsians for most of the Cretaceous. It's cool. So looking forward to hearing more. In other news, in South Dakota, a T-Rex jawbone was found in Meade County about 40 years ago is now getting some preservation work done. And the fossil has been stored at the South Dakota School of Mines for the last four decades or so. And now students there are going to be replacing some of the gap filler in the cracks of the bone. And that includes something like paper mache and also oh, really? archival glue. The school is the only one in the U.S. that offers a master in science in paleontology. I'm pretty sure we've talked about this school before. And the fossil will stay on display at the Museum of Geology. That's cool. I didn't realize that they had a T-Rex jawbone over there. Me either, but they've had it for 40 years. Yeah. Sounds like it could use some updated preservation if it's held together with paper mache. Mm. Or something like it, yeah. In Southern California, the dinosaurs that you see when you're driving on your way to Palm Springs, it's in that Pee Wee Herman movie, they got a Christmas makeover for the holiday season. So Mr. Rex is the T-Rex has been repainted to wear a Santa suit. And Dinny the Brontosaurus has also been repainted a... holiday green i suppose and they said soon the area is also going to be filled with lights it's a lot of work repainting those dinosaurs yeah if you're a fan of the tv show avatar the last airbender there's a really awesome video it's made by arturo garcia and he remade the intro to the show but replaced all of the benders with dinosaurs so you've got spinosaurus as the water bender excellent choice they're all excellent choices ankylosaurus as the earth bender dakota raptor as the firebender and as dark it as the airbender. And it's really well done. And I know there's been calls now. People want the whole series to be remade with dinosaurs. <laughs> I don't think that'll happen, but I would love it if it did. Yeah. As much as I love Ankylosaurus, it doesn't seem like the best choice for Earthbender. It seems like it should be something like Erictodromius or one of these ones we know that burrowed. Oh, that's true. But Ankylosaurus can use its tail and pound at the earth and get a bunch of dirt up. Yeah. I mean, I guess if that's what's going on in the animations, then that makes sense. It's really well done. And it's just the intro, so it's pretty short to watch. Last, there's a couple that posed for their engagement photos in dinosaur costumes. One in an inflatable T-Rex, the other in an inflatable Triceratops costume. And uh, what I really liked about it is when we posted it, one of our followers retweeted and said, quote, Was it love at first sight or did he meet herbivore? (laughs) Solid joke. Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to give a quick review and overview of Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous. We got to watch it with our patrons over the course of a few weeks, and it was really enjoyable. 
Yeah, basically the overall setting is you've got six kids in Jurassic World. It takes place before the first Jurassic World movie and ends just after the first movie. And the idea is there's going to be like a, a kid camp going on at Jurassic World in addition to like the regular places where you'd stay in hotels. This is like the nature experience where the parents can dump their kids off for the summer. And they're doing like a preview, I guess, of it. It's kind of weird. So there's only the six kids there. There's a jock, a YouTuber, a villain, <laughs> as I like to describe her. She's uh, not, I wouldn't describe her as a villain, but Garrett really had it out for her. It's, pretty, it's fun to have an enemy. There's a preppy one, and then there's basically a couple of normal kids. So shenanigans ensue mm -hmm. as th basically their camp counselors have to go deal with all the insanity that's going on in Jurassic World. So they're on their own out in the big, scary dinosaur world. Oh, yeah. And they encounter a lot of dinosaurs. They do. And they're all, all the dinosaurs are pretty well animated. I, I enjoyed those parts of it. Mm -hmm. There was one enormous plot hole that kind of ruined it for me, which is they added an extensive tunnel system under the island. And in the first episode, they go into one of these tunnels to sneak around without getting in trouble. And then, you know, in the rest of the movie, it's like they have to be escaping from things all the time and hiding and whatever. And they never go into the tunnels. It's like, you know, there are these tunnels that are perfectly safe and under the whole island, you can get anywhere in them and they just never go to the tunnels. It drove me a little crazy. But they, they do go to some tunnels. Yeah. It's a really fast paced and quick show. There's only eight episodes. Yeah, and they're like 20 minutes each or so. And each episode ends on basically a cliffhanger. So it was hard for us not, to not binge it all. Yeah, originally I wanted to watch two episodes and then everyone was like, we got to watch a third one. So then, <laughs> I mean, if you do three, then it's about an hour, a little bit over an hour. So even all eight of them is a lot less than a normal show you might binge watch. And at the end... It has a pretty good opening for the next season, which is supposed to start next year, which is good. Even better than that is that there's a baby ankylosaurus named Bumpy, which is awesome. Bumpy's I, very cute. I love Bumpy. And loyal, turns out. Yeah, like any good ankylosaur would be. One good thing I really liked a conversation with our patrons was what's Bumpy going to look like in the next season? Because ankylosaurs grow pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Well, and the trajectory just in this season, it grew from an egg to, I don't know, the size of a couple hundred pounds. And I don't, I think it was supposed to be like a week. <laughs> it pulled a spike. It was even more extreme than the, the real growth rate of these crazy mega herbivores. It's just like Land Before Time when Spike hatches out of the egg and then starts eating and is all of a sudden bigger than Ducky. Oh, that's true. Like in that one two-minute clip or less. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> it's a fast metabolism. But yeah, I think, I think it was pretty good. I think it's worth a watch for kids and adults, especially adults interested in dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. They have some really pretty scenes, too. Some nice imagery. Yeah, at the very least, there's some fun dinosaurs to look at. Mm-hmm. And then they allude to what's going on in Jurassic World a lot. You hear a lot about Claire. Mm -hmm. And people are trying to reach Claire. Of course, she's busy. And then someone inexplicably who doesn't know who Claire is. Oh, yeah, that was weird. Like, why? What? How would you <laughs> not? She's like the CEO. You don't know who she is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a fun scene with the Mosasaurus. Yeah, they hit a lot of the, the highlights of the Jurassic World mm -hmm. canon. And a couple of new dinosaurs, too. Yeah. Maybe they'll have even more new ones in the next season. I hope so. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Sonorosaurus, which was a request from Elrex via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Sonorosaurus was a brachiosaurid that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Arizona in the U.S. and was found in the Turney Ranch Formation. It's estimated to be 49 feet or 15 meters long and 27 feet or 8.2 meters tall, and it weighed about 42 tons. Wow, that's enormous. Yeah, much bigger than the dinosaurs we've been talking about in this episode. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It was an herbivore, and it had gracile limbs like other brachiosaurids and some titanosaurs. So the specimen found was near adult size, and it was compared to giraffe titan. So if it's similar to giraffe titan, that means the specimen was nearly grown. 
Based on bone histology, it grew slowly and sporadically compared to other sauropods. And this slow, irregular growth may have been because of the harsh environment that it lived in. So it lived in this semi-arid environment with seasonal rain and a lot of evergreens. The paleo environment was thought to be coastal, but no marine fossils have been found in the area. And additional analysis found the area to be terrestrial and have fluvial deposits with freshwater invertebrate fossils. So the Turney Range Formation is now interpreted to be a, quote, well-drained, semi-arid, alluvial plain subject to variable precipitation events, end quote. So mostly dry and flat, formed by deposits of sediments over time via rivers. Dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included ornithopods, possibly Tenontosaurus, and Stegosaurus. They also found a claw that's been referred to Deinonychus and a tooth that's been referred to Acrocanthosaurus. Sonorosaurus may have been eaten by Acrocanthosaurus, and that's based on gouge marks on the bones plus the Acrocanthosaurus tooth that was found nearby. And then other animals that lived around the same time and place included fish, turtles, and crocodilians. The type species is Sonorosaurus thompsoni, and the genus name means Sonora lizard because of the Sonoran Desert. It was described in 1998 by Ronald Paul Ratkovich. And he considered naming it Chihuahuasaurus, <laughs> but thought that wouldn't make sense for a large animal. And that's because of the Chihuahuan Desert that was nearby. I hope they find a dinosaur in the Chihuahua Desert and name it Chihuahuasaurus. Even if it's giant? It makes it better. <laughs> it's so funny if you had a sauropod named Chihuahuasaurus. That's perfect. <laughs> so Sonorosaurus Thompson I was found in November of 1994 by Richard Thompson. That's where the species name comes from who was a geology student at the time, and he found it on Thanksgiving weekend while looking for petrified wood. It's way, that's an excellent find. You're just looking for some boring old wood and you find a dinosaur. <laughs> I think that might be some fighting words for people who study <laughs> petrified wood. <laughs> There's the whole petrified forest. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, how many of them listen to this podcast, really? Mm, I see. Anyway, he found a nearly complete skeleton that was exposed on a rock wall. And Richard Thompson told Ronald Ratkovich from the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum about his discovery, and then a team excavated from 1995 to 1999. David Thayer, the curator of geology at Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, thought that it might be a therizinosaur based on the tail chevron looking like a long hand claw. And then Edwin Colbert was asked to identify the dinosaur, who said based on pictures, he only saw pictures, that it might be a hadrosaur. Ratkovich and Thayer then went to the American Museum of Natural History and looked at the dinosaurs there, and they found that it didn't look like the hadrosaurs that AMNH had, and they thought it might be a new species of hadrosaur. The name Sonorosaurus was used for a few years informally. And it's one of the geologically youngest known brachiosaurids from North America. Yeah, we don't talk a lot about Cretaceous sauropods in North America. The holotype of Sonorosaurus includes postcranial elements, about a third of the skeleton, and also maybe a referred dorsal rib. The holotype was found to have died in an inland environment, but more studies needed to establish the full range of its habitats. For a while, the finds were thought to have had a skull, but it turns out that that was a crushed dorsal vertebra. Wow, that must have been very crushed if it made a dorsal vertebra look like maybe a skull. Mm -hmm. I guess those sauropod vertebrae have a lot of air spaces in them, so they might crush up real nice. <laughs> That's true. In 1995, gastroliths were thought to be in the holotype quarry as well, but the presence of gastroliths in general in sauropods has been challenged. And these gastroliths that were found with Sonorosaurus may have been too polished, and they were also scattered around the quarry, and in the quarry are some deposits with pebbles. So more evidence is needed to determine if what was found were actually gastroliths. It's like we were talking about the other day. If they're too polished, they're probably not gastroliths. Mm -hmm. Sonorosaurus became the state dinosaur of Arizona on April 2018, and they named the state dinosaur because of a letter from 11-year-old Jax Weldon, who learned about California's state dinosaur and thought Arizona should have one, so he wrote to the governor. And then Jax was invited to the state capitol and presented for 10 minutes to the Senate and House, and they passed the legislation soon after. I can't help but think the state dinosaur of Arizona was almost Chihuahuasaurus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty funny. 
But since it did end up being a state dinosaur, Sonorosaurus makes a lot more sense since the Sonora Desert is very famous. Mm -hmm. Plus, it sounds nice to the ears. It does. Sonorous, one might say. Mm. Sonorous Sonorosaurus. Just full of the wordplay jokes today. (laughs) And our fun fact of the day is that although Ajnabia is the first ever hadrosaurid from Africa, there are a couple of hadrosauroid finds that were previously discovered in Africa. I'm just going to go through all of them because you can do that with Africa. There are so few finds. In Tunisia, in the Albion, which is about 40 to 50 million years before Ajnabia was around, there was a probably Iguanodontian, and these fossils were found between 1960 and 2016. As far as I can tell, they're all just iguanodontian teeth, and there isn't really anything else to say about them. There's just like some evidence that there were probably iguanodontians in Tunisia from the middle of the Cretaceous. Hmm. But again, since they're iguanodontians, that makes them not hadrosaurids. They're in hadrosauroid. They're, you know, like a farther out group than the true hadrosaurids. Also, if you go thousands of miles to the south in Angola, there are some Maastrichtian finds, just like Ajnabia. These were found in 1964, and they're also classified as Hadrosauroidea in debt, just like the ones in Tunisia. These were published originally in a Portuguese book from 1964, but fortunately, they were redescribed in 2011 in a pre reviewed article with pictures. And by virtue of that, I got to find out what they had found originally. And it turned out to be a single hadrosauroid toe bone. Wow. Just one toe bone, not the end of the toe, just like a middle of a toe bone. (laughs) Like the smallest, one of the least significant bones one could imagine. But there was enough detail there to notice that it was almost certainly a hadrosauroid. And it has some similarities to our Anosaurus from Niger, so maybe it's in that sort of same group, which would make it a different one than Ajnabia, which seems to have more affinities for the European hadrosaurids. And since I mentioned it, I should also say our Anosaurus is obviously the most famous hadrosauriform from Africa. Hadrosauriforms are an even broader category than hadrosauroids. It's probably... Our Anosaurus is probably from the Aptian, about 50 million years before Ajnabia, and that's before true hadrosaurids had evolved. And our Anosaurus was found in 1976. But really, hadrosaurs, man, between hadrosauroids and hadrosaur forms and hadrosaurids, like the, the term hadrosaur is, seems so fraught to me that I feel like I should just start saying ornithopod. And that seems to be what most paleontologists say these days, because especially with iguanodons and, and iguanodontia and like where they fit being such a mess, I feel like you, if you go with ornithopod, you can't be wrong. Ornithopod or a cow of the Cretaceous. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't really like ornithopod as much because it includes a bunch of early small stuff like Laelanosaura in Australia. And really, I want to give that duck-billed dinosaur sort of idea to it, which is why I say hadrosaur, but... Yeah, then hadrosaur seems vague. Like, am I talking about hadrosaurids or hadrosauroids or hadrosaur forms? Yeah, so I should probably say ornithopod, but I don't think I'm going to. <laughs> and on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And you can also join our growing community at Patreon, patreon.com slash I Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.